Hello everyone, welcome to our bandside worship today. By way of introduction, let me say that during our service, we'll be paying attention to how God is a good shepherd and a determined sweeper, always eager to restore and make whole. Let me also say that we'll be taking a look at your homework from last week. But now, as we draw closer to God in praise and in prayer, and understand who God is and what God is really like, we remember how when they, the people of Israel were deeply disillusioned and disoriented and in despair, thinking that God had given up on them forever, Isaiah signposts them back home to God saying, Here is your God. And then he immediately paints a wonderful word picture. He describes how God is striding towards the people with great purpose to tend them as a shepherd tends a flock, to gather the lambs up into his arms, and to carry them close to his heart, to gently lead those with young. And you know, at a point in history, God's movement towards us takes the form, takes the shape, takes the reality of Jesus, the good shepherd who tells us that he has come to seek and save what is lost. Focusing on core qualities and characteristics of God, the psalmist now calls us deeper into worship, saying, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in love. God will not always accuse or treat us as our sins deserve. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love for those who stand in awe before the Lord. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our wrongdoing from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on all those who stand in awe before Almighty God. For God knows how we are formed. God remembers that we are children of dust who go wrong. You know, after that, what else could we sing but glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son.
And we now come into God's presence in a prayer of hope and thanks, ending with the words of the Lord's Prayer. And our prayer will be led by Doreen Draffen and myself. Let us pray. Remember that your light shines through the deepest darkness. Your love surrounds and summons us. Your life is stronger than death itself, and that your grace sustains us, sufficient as it is for all our needs. Even now, the trees of the wood await spring's reclothing. And we look forward to when the branches will be green again. The sun will rise higher in the sky. Its light will warm upon our faces once more. The days will grow longer. Light will push back the darkness. Bulbs and seeds will come to life and grow. Their flowers will bud and bloom. The ears of the wheat will form and ripen. The grass will grow to feed the cattle. Swallows will return and flit through the skies. Birds will fill the land with song. Through these patterns built into nature, we affirm that you, O God, are faithful and true. As we continue to follow Jesus in the patterns of justice and mercy, compassion and peace he is building into us, Hear us now as we pray together, saying, Our Father, Father in, heaven, in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trials, and, and deliver, deliver us from, from evil. evil. For, For the, the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Our first reading today is Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 10, starting at the bottom of page 1048 in the Pew Bibles. Now, at the, the very beginning of this reading, Jesus is getting grief from the religious bigwigs and know-it-alls. He often did. This time, he responds with three stories in quick succession, one after the other. We're going to read the first two. As you listen, think about these questions. Firstly, what picture of God do you get? Secondly, how might that affect how you think about others and behave towards them? Luke says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering round to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one of them. Does she not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, 
there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the message God has given us to think about together today. Amen. Okay, 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 okay. So, 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 did you all remember? Did you all remember? Smaller people, <laughs> honest at least. Uh, smaller people, did you remember to tell your mums and dads and your grandmas and your grandas that they had homework to do? You forgot, Jake. And what about big people? Did you remember? Well, some of you did and some of you didn't. Mm. So, we'll see what we can remember today. So, what do we have? We have a pencil. We have a snowflake. We have baby's toes. We have a spider. And we have green tea leaves. Okay. Now, can we remember all of those things? What did we have? And I'll tick them off as we go along. What did we have? We had a pencil. Good. We're on a roll. What did we have? We had a snowflake. Good. We had baby's toes. We had, we had a spider. And we had green tea leaves. Super. Okay. I think we could go a little bit further in this. Yeah? Okay. So, just to keep us all on track, we have green tea leaves. We have a spider. We have baby's toes. We have a snowflake. We have a pencil. We have a cup. We have, we have a daisy. We have a violin. We have house keys. We have a ruby. We have an onion. We have a needle and thread. We have a rubber ducky. We have a compass. We have a plug. We have a ferris wheel. We have a thumbtack. That's what we have. So, what did we have? And I'll tick them off as we go along. Right now, don't all, don't all run down the list at once. We'll start and we don't listen this time. We were fantastic the first time around because we got them in order. This time we don't even have to get them in order. Though wouldn't it be fantastic if we did? Okay, so do we have the first one? A baby's toes. Okay, we have baby's toes. And what else do we have? We have a Ferris wheel, good, and someone else was calling something out there. House keys, we did, we have house keys, okay. What else? A cup, thank you, thank you, thank you, Edith, we had a cup. We had a rubber ducky, didn't we? We had a rubber ducky and choir. A needle and thread, a needle and thread, where's my needle and thread? We had a needle and thread, a screwdriver. Well, I'm going to put that one down. I'm going to put it down with a wee note that Doreen is seeing things, <laughs> which is good. Good, at, good attempt, good attempt. Okay, so we did not have a screwdriver. There's not a screwdriver on my list. What did we have? A di we did. We had a daisy. Daisy. Where's my daisy? There's my daisy. We had a daisy. We had a plug. We did have a plug. We had an onion. We had an onion. We did. Where's, my, where's the onion? There's. We had an onion. We had a ruby. And what else did we have? We're nearly there, folks. We had a compass. We did fantastic. We had a. We had a drawing pen, a thumbtack. We had what else? We. You are fantastic. We've already got the plug. We've already got the plug. Fantastic. What else? We had the spider. We had a pencil. Fantastic. And somebody had said a, a snowflake and the green tea leaves. Wow. Give yourselves a big round of applause. Give yourself. That was fantastic. I didn't know if we would manage it all, but we did. Working together, pulling everybody's brains together is a really good thing to do. So that's one lesson we could learn today. But can you imagine trying to keep 
much more than that in mind together. Is there anybody here wants to put their hand up and say, I would have got all of them by myself? No. So it is, it's, that just underlines, it's fantastic to work together. We do so much better working together. And I think that the, the message that Jesus is trying to get across uh, to everybody in the story is, you will all do much, much better if you're working together, out and about, seeking people who are lost, people who are wandering, people who have gone wrong, coming alongside them, helping them, restoring them. You'll do so much better. If you're looking for something like a lost coin, if you're all working together. And I think Jesus is also telling them, and what you're doing is trying to help people understand that the God that we worship is not the God who is kind of out to get you in a bad way, but is out to find you and help you because the God that we worship is a God of compassion. So remember that if you remember nothing else. <laughs> and our song together now is God's love is the best love because it really, really is. And after that, the children and young people will leave for their time together. So, a big thank you to everyone who did their homework and responded with their thoughts about that wonderfully inspiring vision found in Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 to 25. Today, I'm going to give you a little summary of the, the phrases, the ideas, the parts of the passage that stood out for people. Then, next week, we'll take a, a bit more time to explore the reflections that were sent to me. And it's not too late to send me your reflections if you're still working through that passage. So, several people picked up the intriguing image of God creating a new heavens and a new earth before going on to highlight the aspect of the new heavens and the new earth as envisaged by Isaiah 
that resonated most with them. For one, it was, never again will there be an infant who lives but a few days, or an old person who does not live out their years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. For others, it was, people will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. For me, as I said, the standout sentiment in Isaiah 65 is that people will not toil in vain or bear children doomed to misfortune. There is so much good stuff in Isaiah 65. It's difficult for some people to focus on just one phrase. But of those who did, one identified the call that we should be glad and rejoice forever in that which God has made. Two were attracted by God's promise to the people. Before you call, I will answer. While you are still speaking, I will hear. And saw how that promise is still true today. As I said, next week we'll get into how people responded to Isaiah's great vision in more detail. But today, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll weave these ideas and phrases that our attention has been drawn to through our prayers of concern. With that said, let us pray. Restless God, who wants a better world, choices are hard to make, decisions are hard to take. Where there's hardship, cheating, exploitation, dishonesty, hurt, what do we do? When should we speak out and when should we be silent? Have we the courage to follow Isaiah's prophetic lead and the type of life Jesus led. Choosing what's right or wrong, tolerable or intolerable, acceptable or unacceptable, deciding which causes to support, to stand alongside the poor and the precarious, the homeless and the hungry. What should we do? When should we speak out? And when should we be silent? Have we the courage to follow Isaiah's prophetic lead? and the type of life Jesus led. Isaiah understood the need for newness, new heavens, new earth, utter transformation of everything. So did Jesus. May we, in our times, live and be advocates for their shared vision of contented, welcomed children, supported, cared for, older folk, secure, viable communities. May we be glad and rejoice forever in what you have made, O God, by ensuring that nothing in all creation that you made well is either diminished or destroyed, but is enabled to flourish. On our sometimes challenging, stony, uphill way to the new heavens and the new earth. May we trust in our heads, in our hearts, and in our bones that as we are speaking, you are listening. Before we call out, you are already answering. So, in all of the things that we are remembering in prayer, in our own hearts and minds. Show us when to speak out and when to be silent, when to stand up for what we believe. Give us the courage of our convictions. Guide us and our world in the way that we should go. Help us 
to follow Isaiah's prophetic lead and the type of life Jesus led. In his name we pray, and for his sake, amen. And we now affirm our trust in God as we sing together the hymn, The Lord's My Shepherd, I'll Not Want. Our second reading today is Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14, found on page 1052 in the Pew Bibles. It features a Pharisee. See what you make of him, and whether perhaps as you listen, you have a sneaking sense of spiritual superiority to him, not that you would ever say, of course. Luke writes, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is 
the word of the Lord for us this day. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Generous God, open our ears to what you are saying to us through these stories of Jesus we have read today. Deepen and strengthen our faith through them. Teach us more about the ways of your kingdom through them. In the name of the challenging wonder that is always Jesus, and for his sake we pray. Amen. When you stop and think about it, Luke chapter 15 is like a perfectly formed little gospel within the wider gospel. It's like a mini-series entitled Lost and Found, designed to put in a nutshell what it's all about. The first episode introduces the theme of God's love for the wayward in the parable of the lost sheep. It very obviously and very intentionally picks up on the deeply adored, profoundly comforting, endlessly enduring, solidly biblical imagery of God as the Good Shepherd. The second tells the story of the lost coin. Interestingly, it presents God as like a determined woman who will not be thwarted. You may have come across some of those types. And Dr. Luke may rightly be regarded as an early feminist in his support of the role of women in the church and in the world. The third episode that we didn't read this morning, but I know that you know, brings the mini-series to a climax, telling as it does the poignant tale of the prodigal child. Overall, this mini-series, this gem of a chapter, has a, a buoyant feel-good factor. There is a sense of good news virtually all the way. Everything that was lost is found. Rejoice with me, says the good shepherd, as the lost sheep is returned to the flock, making it whole, making it complete, making it perfect once again. The same happens with the woman and the coin. The coin is found and the woman's wealth is restored and returned to what it had been. The lost son comes to his senses and comes home. Relationships in that part of the father's family are reconciled, and the party goes on all night. The message is that God's talent for finding us is immeasurably greater than our talent for getting lost and going wrong. And wonderfully, this divine talent generates joy in heaven as well as on earth. Do you know, I think that these stories are so powerful, and we love them so much because we are able, and in many ways we are invited, to read ourselves into the receiving end of them. The parable of the lost sheep is about us. We are that sheep put on the Lord's shoulders and so full of gratitude and relief that we promise that we will never wander away again. We have those good intentions, even if we're not able to always keep them. We are that coin lying in some dark and dusty corner until the good woman who will not give up on us, sweeps us out into the light and gathers us up and puts us in our rightful place. These stories are about us, and we treasure them, as have generations of people since they were first written. Rightly so, for in their way, they just distill that 
sense of experiencing a grace which enables us to say, I once was lost, but now I'm found. But, 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 if these stories are about us, they are about all of us, every one of us, and every part of us, every attitude within us, every mixed emotion, every pattern that we know we want to break. They are about the part that is full of gratitude to God and the part that remains resentful. For some days, we are, I think if we're honest, a bit like the prodigal's elder brother, who comes across as a bit, and maybe more than a bit, of an on reconstructed Pharisee. Isn't it interesting that these three stories are really directed at the Pharisees? There they were at the start of the passage, in the background, criticizing Jesus yet again for spending his days with flagrant sinners. There they were muttering away, and Jesus heard their muttering, and he immediately told the tale of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the fractured family. Now, the Pharisees get a bad press, and I'm almost tempted to say, and rightly so. But in fairness, when you think Pharisee, think moral person, think committed person, think believing person. As a cohort, the Pharisees were God-fearing, church-going, law-keeping, hard-working. They were, well, disciplined disciples of deep faith who tried to set an example to others that it was possible to get on the right side of God. But when, in their view, people did not make the grade, fell short, messed up, and in their judgmental smugness, they looked down on them, as the second reading puts it. They knew who was in and who was out. They knew what everyone deserved, and they believed that they were first in line for all of the kudos that were coming. Then along comes Jesus and turns their world upside down. Along comes Jesus and scrambles their carefully constructed schemes. And think about this. These parables in Luke 15 are not only directed against the Pharisees back then. They are also directed against the Pharisee lurking within each one of us. As you heard, Jesus began the first parable in his little mini-series, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep. Do you see? Here, Jesus is not inviting the Pharisees to imagine themselves as sheep, but as the shepherd. He's inviting them to change their mindset. He is inviting them to keep searching for the stray sheep through the wilderness, to keep on sweeping for the lost coin until it is found. Jesus is inviting them and us to start the long, hard journey of giving up self-righteousness and joining God in God's mission of seeking and sweeping and finding rather than standing at a distance and condemning. In its way, I think, this chapter warns us not to become new Pharisees, finding new reasons for looking down on others. Instead, 
it challenges us to grow into good shepherds and determined sweepers until all the sheep have been returned to the fold, until all the coins have been found, until all the children have come home to God, even folk like the elder brother in the parable of the prodigal son. God will not rest or give up until all, all God's family is found and straightened out in their thinking, in how they relate to others, and to the world. Amen. Our final hymn today is Name of All Majesty, during which the offering will be brought forward. transformation at work within us. Turn us from self-righteousness to love of our neighbors and concern for others. Take our offering as a sign of our willingness to be on this journey of discipleship and for your use as you seek and save what is lost. May God, the Good Shepherd, protect and lead us as we seek true well-being in our souls and in our society. May God, who restores and reorders, bring out the qualities in our spiritual lives that will enable us to serve the Lord more fully with the gifts that we have been given. And may the blessing of God Almighty, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us this day and forevermore. Amen.